Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our data collection in retail workshop. Uh, my name is uh, Anna Sharma. I am event manager, and I'm also going to moderate this workshop for you. So if you have any questions or you need help, please answer, uh, ask me through the chat. Also, I will uh, help you to ask the questions to the speakers. We are going to have a dedicated time for it, and I will read out your questions to the speakers. And um, while we are still waiting uh, other people to join, I just want to share with you some facts about the audience that we have today. Uh, we have uh, 300 uh, 19 registered attendees for this workshop from 271 companies, which is uh, very exciting to see and 35 countries. So the time difference is not stopping you from learning new things. Uh, and we have software engineers and developers and data scientists and architects and team leads here uh, from global and local companies. And uh, it really means that uh, data collection in retail is uh, on everyone's mind nowadays. And uh, if we, you see on the next, look at the next slide, you would see that 40% uh, um, of the people who joined today's uh, workshop are beginners, meaning that a lot of companies now are turning their heads towards uh, data collection from the open, open source. But we also see that uh, we have a lot of uh, people with experience and with a great experience with automated crawling and in-depth knowledge. So uh, I have a good news for both of you and for beginners and for the experts that uh, we are going to cover data collection from end from start to end. And uh, uh, you will have a recording uh, after this uh, workshop is over, you will have a recording on the next day and you can watch it over and, uh, you know, pick up the moments that were not uh, clear from the start. So um, this is uh, what we are going to discuss today. This is our agenda. So first, uh, Tamir Rotter, VP Sales of Luminati, will give you a strategic overview of a strategic role of data collection in retail. He will share with you best practices and use cases uh, that Luminati as a unique, with its unique uh, role in the market uh, have witnessed. Uh, later on, Aviv Bisinski, product manager, will uh, talk about data collection infrastructure because data collection in retail uh, requires uh, mass scale and um, for many cases, real time data collection. Uh, Aviv is going to um, explain what uh, infrastructure is required to support such operation. And the next speaker, uh, Krista Fudali, is going to talk about uh, automation and proxy management. Uh, those of you who have experience in uh, uh, data collection know the, the role of uh, import and importance of uh, proper IP, IP infrastructure and also how much time does it take to uh, maintain it and uh, to to uh, to manage it. So how to uh, reduce that load on your developers, on your team, and how to make it uh, automated and allow you to scale your operations, this uh, Chris will tell you. And uh, the last topic is going to be uh, active and uh, passive fingerprinting, because uh, right now uh, you probably know it that the bot detection technique go way beyond the IP infrastructure. There is a canvas fingerprinting, there are different types of uh, uh, protocols required, and all this in detail will uh, disclose uh, Josh van der Willek, a product manager who is developing uh, our unblocker and uh, data collection automation system. So if uh, we are going to have uh, for uh, Q&A session after each speaker will finish uh, his part. So uh, if you want to ask a question, just uh, raise your hand. You have a, a button here below. So raise your hand and I will allow you to speak and you can ask your question live. Or if you don't want to, to go live with your voice, you just uh, type in the Q&A button. 
press the Q&A button and uh, write your question there and I will read it. Uh, also, I want to remind you that uh, the 30 minute one-on-one uh, -on -one session is a part of the workshop. And uh, since we are not going to cover all the questions because we have only two hours, uh, you can use your personal link from your email and uh, have a session with one of the Illuminati experts after this workshop is over. So uh, I guess uh, most of the audience already joined uh, our workshop and watching. So we are starting the main part. And uh, let me introduce Tamir Rotter, VP of Sales, uh, with his uh, keynotes about strategic role of data collection in retail. Tamir? Tamir? Tamir, we cannot hear you. Can you unmute? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry, apologize. So I was, <laughs> yes, I was speaking and... this session uh, about the, uh, uh, I was speaking this session about the uh, uh, overall introduction into the subject. Uh, what are the key challenges that you have with uh, a retail data collection? Uh, how uh, we help address them? What are the real use cases that companies are uh, uh, collecting uh, data on in retail? And finally, how you can really start your operation. Um, the first challenge that you might uh, be aware of or might not be aware of is that a lot of the website actually uh, return different contents, different prices, different ads, depending on uh, where you're coming from. So uh, depending on uh, your location, you, see, you could see a totally different price, uh, a totally different content. And uh, also you could uh, run into some uh, bot management solutions that would actually block you. So you need to make sure that you get the right price relevant to you or, or understand the price variety, as well as uh, overcome those bot management solutions. Another type of uh, challenge is uh, what we call cloaking. Uh, so if you're, as a retailer, uh, trying to go to your competitor uh, website, uh, sometimes they can actually identify by your IP that it's you coming and maybe serve you a different price than what they would serve a consumer. Or you could think that uh, that could be easily outsmart by using any kind of uh, a proxy data center. Uh, but those data center IPs are also easily identifiable and then you are likely to see the, uh, the same result. You would get a different price sometimes than what your uh, consumers would see. So that's kind of a second challenge to uh, address. And a third one is, let's say that we uh, know the right geography, the ge geographical differences, the cloaking and everything, and we believe that we have the right price. The price is only right for the minute uh, we actually collected it. Because as we see in this example of uh, a GE, uh, microwave oven over three uh, internet shops. The price change in Amazon like nine times, in Best Buy like two times during the 24 hour window. So the price also needs to be up to date. So how Luminati helps address all those uh, challenges? What we've done is we've built a very, very unique network of real consumers that are really, really ready to help us. Why they do it? Uh, very simple. Uh, we. Uh, partnered with a lot of app developers. Those app developers have actually, uh, uh, are actually being paid by us and they offer ad free or subscription free uh, subscription to the uh, app users uh, in return for participating in, in our global proxy network uh, when their devices are idle, when they're connected to the internet, et cetera. And by that, we were able to build a very, very unique uh, network of more than 72 million consumers that we could use to uh, understand the data collection. Uh, and that's actually uh, the, the starting point of how we started Luminati and how we built Luminati to be today uh, the world's largest uh, web data collection enablement platform that allows you to use uh, real users, real consumers' uh, IPs in order to overcome blocking, cloaking, geo content management, and so forth. With the use of uh, uh, those consumer uh, IPs, you could actually see the same picture, get the same 
price and the same data that those consumers see uh, and you have the same transparency that you need in order to set your own pricing strategy. And as a market leader uh, in this domain, uh, we, we do have an overall view. Uh, we do offer also expertise coming from more than 10,000 customers, 40% uh, of the world's top e-commerce websites, uh, 72 million consumer IPs and another 1 million data center IPs. And then another uh, nine petabytes of traffic that goes through our network uh, through uh, those consumers. The uh, Luminati solutions could actually be used in three layers and three levels. The uh, most basic one is just using the proxy infrastructure, uh, the largest in the world. The second one is actually two solutions that we built on top of this proxy infrastructure. One is a, a, a manual or a user-defined uh, uh, data collection software called the Luminati Proxy Manager. We'll see more on it in the future sessions, as well as the uh, uh, data unblocker that uh, allows us to automatically unblock a lot of the uh, uh, mechanisms, a lot of the problems that you might uh, encounter when you're doing data collection. And the third, maybe most automated way is actually defining to Luminati uh, what it is you want to collect and using uh, the uh, data collection automation service that allows you to uh, uh, forget about all the uh, uh, technical part to just define what it is you need to collect. And th then we do the collection, we do the uh, uh, data parsing for you and we serve it back into your servers in the uh, data format and uh, uh, database uh, format that you prefer. Actually, a lot of us saw a lot of changes around COVID-19 and probably not a surprise for uh, most of you, COVID-19 really changed uh, e-retail or e-commerce and increased a lot of the uh, uh, dependency on web data collection. Uh, obviously during the lockdown times, all the trade was really online and uh, we've noticed with our partner more than 500% uh, more than increase uh, of online grocery sales in the UK, 800% increase in the US. Uh, and if anybody was uh, still relying on the old data collection mechanism of uh, uh, mystery shoppers that go around and collect the data for them, whether it's their own employees or whether it's market research firms, they became really uh, non, non productive at all. Uh, but even when those restrictions were relaxed, people started to shop much more online. Uh, and there's a lot of data to actually support it. But maybe the most important one is that uh, we analyzed the uh, 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 e-commerce buying or usage uh, uh, usage uh, uh, changes in the UK, and we could see that 15% of the senior citizens in the UK who were not shopping before uh, the, the COVID uh, lockdown are now uh, using uh, e-commerce and they will continue and use, and they do continue and use e-commerce now. So kind of uh, uh, we, we broke a very important adoption uh, uh, hurdle. So what are the use cases? So how people actually collect the uh, data? There's five common use cases that we see. Uh, the most obvious one is uh, using uh, real-time pricing intelligence, understanding uh, what prices are out there, what are the geo, uh, what are the geo-specific pricing that is out there, and uh, taking that into consideration within our uh, pricing uh, algorithms. Uh, the second one is analyzing for different products, for different keywords, uh, how uh, they are ranked, whether it's within Google and other search engines, or it's within marketplaces like uh, eBay, Amazon, etc. The third is uh, looking at the market inventory. Uh, if you uh, are monitoring your competitors, if you don't only uh, want to know their prices, you also want to know what is available now, what is not available now, whether if it's fashion, what sizes are available or not available now. And that may have an impact on your uh, uh, pricing uh, mechanism on your pricing strategy. The third is trying to do sales forecasting and understanding how flash sales progress in different places uh, in order to understand how to build your, uh, your both sales and uh, marketing strategies. And the final one is uh, looking at product descriptions, product reviews customer feedback uh, and understand how different products are doing, how different websites are doing uh, in terms of the service, in terms of customer satisfaction, in terms of how products are being uh, presented and so forth. And let's look at two use cases. The first one is of the uh, real-time pricing intelligence. This is a real Illuminati customer, which is a leading retail chain. 
the challenge that they shared with us is that they wanted to scale the data collection over uh, eight target websites and overcome a lot of the uh, blocks attempts and uh, getting live data uh, from all those target websites. And the option and the question was how to do it successfully and also you know, how to uh, uh, split the, that without uh, consuming too much data over a uh, uh, you know, uh, short period of time. Uh, the solution they built with us was actually to look at some of the products uh, on a daily basis, some on a weekly basis across all the eight competitors and focus four times a day on collection from three uh, most important uh, competitor targets for the key products, for the high selling products. They basically take all this information and uh, feed it into a dynamic pricing algorithm that takes this live data into account and adjust the prices. Uh, and after they've run that successfully for a few months, they actually uh, shared the outcome. And that's uh, uh, the, re the real time price optimization increased the gross earnings by 10%. Another type of uh, use case is uh, doing sales forecasting based on flash sales progress. So that's one of our Asian uh, e-commerce uh, websites. And the challenge they had was really understanding how uh, flash sales of fast selling uh, products are progressing over time. Uh, and uh, what they did is they monitor those flash sales uh, on an hourly basis to understand what at what price things are being sold and how the quantity is changing. Uh, and uh, by doing that over uh, the whole uh, flash sale process, they could understand how, uh, you know, what are the times that the product is selling more, what are the times that, that the product is selling uh, maybe slower. And uh, with that, improving the product duration, the pricing strategy, and trying to uh, build up the right stocks of those uh, key high selling products uh, ongoing. So we understood some of the use cases. If uh, a lot of you are looking at uh, starting or, or improving your uh, uh, data collection, what is the right strategy? So basically there are three ways to uh, go about it. Uh, the first one, which we would focus most of today's uh, workshop on is to uh, collect uh, the data your own with, uh, on your own with uh, your web data development team. The second one would be uh, uh, looking at the uh, Luminati and the data collection automation, have the data actually collected for you. Uh, and the third one is really relying on some of our partners. We, we have hundreds of partners that are, or, or that are using our infrastructure uh, in order to provide different services. And they, that makes a lot of sense for you if you are looking for more than just the data. So those partners are usually able to uh, provide you with additional analytics, price algorithm alerts uh, and additional value than just the data itself. So if that's very important for you, then that makes a lot of sense to use as well. So as a summary of uh, this introduction, I could say that companies find it really hard to compete and to, to adjust their pricing without uh, doing ongoing data collection. It's not a one-time exercise. It's something that you need to do uh, considering uh, both the, the, the time, uh, like, from one hour to the next, as well as the uh, geo differences. You really want to rely on real consumers IPs in order to uh, make sure you get the right data and you're not being cloaked. And there's actually quite a lot of information that you can uh, collect. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a hard choice sometimes what you want to focus on, uh, but it's a choice you must make and you should prioritize your data collection efforts based on uh, what provides the most value to you now. Finally, uh, what we recommend is to build a strategy that could look at the different options that you have, whether it's uh, uh, doing it in-house, whether it's uh, outsourcing to uh, Luminati or uh, using a, a partner solution. And it really all boils down to understanding what skills you have or you don't have in-house, what uh, available stuff you have or you don't have uh, in-house. And obviously the, the limitations of those different collection uh, approaches because once you take things and you outsource them, that you might have a little bit less control on how things are being collected, uh, how often they're being collected, uh, and that might be important for you uh, when you consider the solution. So in the next sessions, we will focus more on the actual technical collection and how to overcome those challenges that we've mentioned. Uh, and uh, now I'm really uh, putting it back to you to see if you have any questions. Um, if you have any questions, I'm just reminding you that you have a Q&A um, button below. And um, 
and uh, take uh, take take the opportunity and uh, uh, ask uh, the question now. I see that uh, we have one question from uh, Naveen, uh, who is asking Tamir, how do you collect sales data? Uh, Naveen, please let, let us know if uh, in his last uh, part, uh, Tamir answered your question because... I will okay. briefly uh, touch on it. So when you're doing flash sales, it's, uh, uh, quite, uh, it's quite common to have like a quantity. So uh, the e-commerce site says I'm putting 10,000 units or 1,000 units for uh, a, a sale at a very unique price. And we're basically tracking hour by hour or every 30 minutes how, uh, you know, how many units are available. You can usually collect it from uh, the flash sale uh, way, uh, web page. And as you track it over time, you understand the sales quantities. Uh, Fabian, um, Fabian is asking if you have a site that you want to web scrape periodically, can you identify and display display all the difference between two consecutive uh, sessions, or would you need would I need to do that in, in the application or database level? So what we do, we allow you to uh, collect the data and store it in a you know in a data set. Whether you know if you do the collection, it could be. Your data set, if we do the collection, then we could do the collection from two different geographies. And when we provide the data, it's up to you to define, you know, how you want those, the data served to you. And definitely we could, uh, uh, we usually highlight in those cases that it is being collected from one endpoint versus another endpoint. Uh, and then it's easy to see the difference. Uh, okay. And uh, how, how you manage the real time data, an example, uh, dynamic. Okay, so usually the uh, data collection itself, if you limit it to uh, not too many sources, uh, it's something that happens within seconds. So uh, the time it takes you to send requests, you send parallel requests to let's say three uh, of your competitors, get the data, get it back in to your algorithm, it's, it's like five seconds. And then you're usually within maximum 10 seconds able to uh, uh, apply your own uh, real time uh, uh, pricing algorithm and serve the best price back. Uh, you could do it in real time. So uh, it's mostly in travel that we see customers that do it in real time. In e-commerce, usually it's enough that you do it on your own, let's say on an hourly basis or on a you know, 30 minutes interval. So you do that calculation on your own once uh, every interval, and then you adjust the available price uh, or the offered price on the website. Okay. Um... Uh, I, I see, no, guys, I see a lot of technical questions like uh, how do you deal with the blocking that uh, e-commerce site block proxy and um, what uh, procedures do we recommend? It's exactly what we are going to discuss right now with uh, Aviv, Josh and Chris, our product manager, our tech team. Uh, so uh, thank you, Tamir, for giving the strategic overview of the topic. And uh, I want to introduce uh, Aviv uh, Bissi product manager who will uh, start uh, explaining what exactly required for you to run such a huge uh, data collection projects, how to maintain infrastructure which is required for real-time data collection. So please, Aviv, uh, take care, take, take it from here. Okay, hi everyone. Happy everyone could make it. So, my name is Aviv Basinski. I'm a product manager in Luminati. I manage two proxy networks, the static residential network and the data center network, and also a product called SERP, the search engine results page. I'll be happy to take any questions when I'm done. So let's get right to it. Mary, you're not sharing your screen. Aviv, sorry, you are not sharing your screen. Sure. You can see my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. So we're gonna talk about a few topics and um, parameters for success. And uh, we'll dig into that. Also, you are not in the presenter mode. We can see like in the entire desktop. One second. Okay. Yeah, now it's okay. Yes, now it's okay? No. 
No, it was better a second ago. Yeah, like this is fine. Okay, nothing changed, but let's uh, let's continue. Okay, so we're going to talk about a few parameters for um, what would make a successful data collection. We're going to talk about speed, scale, success rate, and accuracy. So let's start with speed. So when we talk about speed, what we're talking about really is the round trip for the request you make. So you make a request through the Illuminati infrastructure, and then you go through our servers, you go to the internet, to the target site, and then back through our infrastructure and you get the response. And that takes time. This is the round trip we're talking about. And that has, of course, implications, uh, whether it's a you know, long latency or short, uh, that could mean a lot for uh, different use cases. So a few good, good examples would be anything related to real-time data collection. If you can imagine one of these websites where you uh, search for a flight and try to look for the cheapest flight, many of these websites will compare in real time and collect data in real time. And then if it takes, let's say five or 10 seconds, there's probably a much higher um, uh, chance that you're actually going to buy a ticket uh, than versus something like it'll take two minutes. In that case, you're probably going to leave the website and go to a competitor. So this is something very important. And there's different ways we can improve that. Um, it starts with the architecture on the vendor side. So just for example, uh, we have super proxies in our system and we've made uh, the super proxies that you go through automatically be the one closest to you. So we do these kind of things to reduce the latency. And then there's different things you can do on your side to make it shorter as well. It depends on the type of IP that you're using and different setups on your uh, internal architecture. So this is definitely something you want to take into account. The second thing is maximizing value from your existing resources. So the more requests you can send in a given time and the more responses you can get allows you to collect more data in real time and then make more value in a shorter time period. And um, so that's of course uh, also very important. The next topic is scale. So I wrote here that a customer and provider should be able to support usage spikes mainly. Uh, as for the provider, it means that our architecture, our system, our network should be able to uh, support uh, whatever usage you have and, and routine. And also when you have usage spikes, that's something that we've never encountered a problem with. So, but it is something that you want to check if you're starting to work with a new provider. And as for the customer, it means that your own architecture needs to support your usage spikes. So just a quick example, if you're sending requests through a server, which has, a, let's say, a, a 200 Mbps connection, but you're sending more, but you're sending 1,000 requests per second, that's probably not going to be supported by your server. That's something you want to take into account. Also, data quality can vary with different scales. So it might work fine on a low scale, but then when you start sending more and more requests, for example, on some uh, hot season, then you might notice that uh, the target site starts sending you false information or corrupted information. Uh, so that's something you also wanna keep in mind when you scale. It's not only if technically you can send the requests, but also are they successful and uh, is the data correct? And just bottom line is you wanna make sure you don't have any bottlenecks uh, in your data collection operation. A quick example would be Christmas season peak. You send uh, an X amount of requests every day and then suddenly in Christmas you send 10 X. Uh, you need to be, make sure that the data comes back in the right quality, that your uh, infrastructure and the uh, provider infrastructure can support it, all the things that we discussed above. This is very important, especially on the high seasons. Third, we're gonna speak about success rates. Um, it sounds straightforward, but it is something that um, has more implication than just uh, am I successful or not? So it could take more time to get the data I need if my success rate is low. Uh, probably most importantly, if my success rate is low, then even if I get the data I need in the end of the day, I'm probably going to spend a lot of time debugging instead of building my products and success and conversions and so on. And obviously, I want to spend most of the time uh, building my company, not debugging uh, unsuccessful requests. The third thing is that um, when you have a low success rate, you're actually paying more for the data. So this is like a simple equation here. If I'll take a quick example, if you have a 50% success rate, you're actually paying two times more for the, day you're, the data that you're collecting. 
So this actually has a significant financial implication. And that's definitely something that you want to take into account. And um, the fourth point is accuracy. So it actually relates to uh, the scale we discussed. Uh, so you want to make sure that the data that you're collecting is accurate. And that means not only the request was successful, but also it's presenting the right data. It's not being spoofed. There's different ways to check that. Um, there's different ways to check also anomalies. So for example, you're getting some a price rating for uh, around some range for a long time, and then suddenly there's an anomaly. The prices skyrocket or go down or something of that sort. You probably want to check if you're getting false information. So this is very important for uh, database decision making. It's important for real time uh, data collection, uh, database products, and so on. And it means that you need to put some thought into the data quality verification. Not only did I get the data, but also is it the right data? Let's talk about a few things now related to the infrastructure and the layers above the infrastructure. So on the bottom, we have the proxy infrastructure. Um, it's also a standalone product. So it could be one of our proxy network, which we'll discuss soon. But also that would be the infrastructure behind some of our other products the, that uh, Tamil had mentioned and uh, Josh will also speak about uh, later on. And so that's the proxy infrastructure, the grid, so-called. Then above that, we have the proxy management layer. And we go through the infrastructure, but we need to manage it. We need to manage sessions, cookies, user agents, different rules that all needs to be managed. Also a uh, debugging, analyzing, collecting logs and so on. This is done through our proxy manager. Chris is going to talk about that soon enough. And above that, there's the digital fingerprinting. Uh, since we all know websites are becoming more and more sophisticated, it's becoming more critical to have a higher level of a, a code and a proxy management using the right cookies, fingerprints, and so on. Josh is going to talk about that uh, also uh, as we continue. So I'll just elaborate a little bit about the proxy infrastructure and things related to that. So there's a few elements that we need to take into account. When we go through a proxy infrastructure and there's different proxy types, different proxy networks, for example, residential, data center, mobile, a static residential. The important note about that is that these are the IP type is an IP property. It means that's just a given. It's a, a value assigned to that IP address, and uh, there's nothing you can do to change it. So unlike other things, like user agents or uh, other parameters, you cannot change the IP type. If it has any importance, and it does for your proxy uh, operation, for your data collection, then it, you need to make sure to use the right IP type. And also, you need to be aware that and um, this is something that you won't be able to get at scale by just getting a few servers. This is something that in order to accomplish, you need to go through a proxy network. Then we have the scale. This is a network property. It means that um, we allow you to go through uh, millions of IPs, many millions of IPs, and that has a, a great implication on the success rate, the ability to scale, to uh, get more data in a shorter time period. Uh, and that's something that you cannot reproduce with just getting a, a bigger and stronger server or a handful of them. You need to go through a proxy infrastructure. And third is global coverage. And this relates to both the IP properties and the network property. So um, the IP itself is listed with a specific geolocation. That's not something you can manipulate through code. That's just a given. And it's listed in different geolocation uh, databases that websites use. And then there's also uh, global coverage and that means if you're going through a network that offers a wide global coverage, it means you can go through uh, go out through different uh, geolocation exit nodes. Uh, if you to reproduce that uh, without going through a proxy infrastructure would mean getting a large number of servers uh, and place them out through different physical locations around the world. Sorry. So a small example would be. Um, that will emphasize the three points is using a proxy infrastructure versus trying to get one server and collecting data. So let's say you want to collect a, a pricing data and then you get one server, you place it in the United States. In that case, the server would have a data center IP, IP type, it would be a data center. And uh, the websites would notice that and might, that might uh, affect the quality of data you get or your success rate. Also the, um, scale you could reach with one server would obviously be very, very limited. 
And third, the IP is listed as a certain country, in this case, the United States. That means if you need to check information relevant for different geolocations, that would not be possible. Great, so now we're gonna talk about uh, a few types of, uh, of the ways websites look at your uh, IP or your requests and classify them or apply different blockings to them. So there's three main groups. One is the IP-based classifications, second is geo-based, and the third is rate limiting. So we'll say a few words about each of them. So let's start with the uh, IP type. There you can see here in the picture that uh, there's a few types of IPs. Uh, most commonly, we have a data center type of IP. This is usually server IPs. And then we have uh, the uh, fixed line ISP or mobile ISP. These are residential IPs. It means when you, when you go, let's say now you take your home computer and go and check uh, your IP type, it's most likely going to be a, a ISP type IP. That means it's a human user. It's an IP assigned to a home or to a mobile device. So that has different implications on how the website look at you. And this, as I said before, is a property of the IP. So in a few words about each of the main proxy networks. We have the data center network. Luminati has uh, today already close to 1 million IPs and uh, rapidly expanding around 93 or 95 countries. The key advantages of a, a data center IP is that it's more cost efficient, it's cheaper, and if you can work with it and uh, manage to get the data you need, it's just more cost efficient. It's fast and it's stable. The reason it's fast is because there's just less hops on the way. So the round trip we discussed earlier is shorter. That means you get your data qu quicker. And if you're do, doing real-time data collection, that's uh, very important. And secondly, it's stable. It means the IP doesn't rotate. Unlike with a residential peer-to-peer -peer network, which I'll uh, say a few words about soon enough, this, uh, with this IP type, the IP will not rotate at all, uh, unless you want it to. And third is that uh, it has uh, also a pretty wide global coverage. You can go through a, a variety of countries and cities. As for the disadvantages, uh, the pool is big, but comparing to the residential peer-to-peer -peer network, for example, it's much, much smaller. There's close to 1 million IPs versus 72 million IPs for the residential. Uh, that means the pool is smaller and also data center IPs are easier to detect. That's not to say that you can't do almost anything with data center IPs, but the websites might be less forgiven, forgiving when they see that it's uh, the IP type is a data center. As for the residential network, so this is actually the first product Luminati came out with uh, a few years ago. Uh, it's probably the largest residential network or primary proxy network in the world with around 72 million IPs per month. These are real user IPs coming through our SDK. So when you go to the website, this is our actual real user IP. This is uh, amazing and it gives great performance. And um, you can target pretty much any country, city, ASN, carrier, and so on in the world. The coverage is amazing. And since it's real user IPs, these are almost 100% undetectable. And also since the pool is so big, it allows you to send pretty much an infinite amount of concurrent connections. So any amount of data you need in a given time, in terms of scale, we can support it. Uh, so as for use cases, just any large scale operation or one that re would require um, having IPs of real users would be fit for um, the, re the residential IPs, pretty much any use case. The static residential IPs are one of our, it's actually our newest proxy network. It's been around for around one year, one year plus. And the reason we introduced it to Luminati is that we had a growing demand for customers that must have residential IPs, but at the same time, they're having problems with IP rotating. So this is kind of a middle ground solution the static residential IPs we get directly from ISPs, but they're hosted in a data center-like architecture. That means we can keep them for as long as we want in the same way as data center IPs. So they don't rotate. At the same time, they're fast and stable, just like a data center IP. And they give great performance, very hard to detect since they are real residential IPs. And so again, very hard to detect for that for these reasons. The second type of restrictions or classification is a geo-based classification. So today websites in many, many cases, especially in e-commerce, when you go to a website, it first checks where you're coming from and then it'll, it might serve you a, a custom a content 
or language and uh, maybe the flow of uh, the user experience is a, a bit different. Uh, also, you might have different pricing. In other cases, uh, there's some features that can be open or blocked based on the geolocation. So for example, uh, it's very common that you can go to an e-commerce website and then you get to, you, you want to check out and um, you see that shipping is blocked for your geolocation. In order to do that, the websites need to see what's your geolocation. Also, if you want to collect pricing that's relevant for different uh, countries, then you would need to go through the right exit nodes so that you would be served the right information. Um, some services are blocked altogether. Uh, we see that many times with streaming services, which are, which are just open or blocked for different geolocations. And also there's the entire ad industry and ad verification uh, specifically. So in order to monitor and uh, sample and check out uh, ad campaigns, you want to go through the right exit nodes for the right country. This way you get uh, information that's relevant for a, a specific campaign going in some uh, geolocation or some geo-based campaign. And the third part is the rate limitations. So websites uh, for a long time have been uh, using rate limitations. Originally, this is something that's used for uh, not allowing an option of uh, harming the website, something like a DDoS attack and so on. So if you make more than a certain number of requests then your uh, IP will be, will be banned and blocked. Uh, when we uh, connect that to a proxy uh, operation or data collection operation, then what that means is you make a request with one IP, that IP might be blocked, and then you cannot use it anymore until the cooling period, whatever it is, is over. There are different cooling periods for different websites. Once that's over, you can keep collecting again. Basically, the website will uh, spot too many requests uh, uh, for a given time frame. It'll flag your IP and it will ban it. But more than that, uh, the, the websites today will uh, try to look for a connection between the different IPs that they flag. And then if, for example, they find that two IPs are coming from the same uh, subnet, then it's possible that the entire subnet will be blocked. So here's a small example. Let's say the website detected two IP from a slash 24 block, which is a block of 256 IPs. In that case, it'll block, it might block the entire 256 IPs and not only two IPs <clears throat> that reach the rate limit. That means that maybe you have in your uh, Luminati account, let's say 1,000 IPs from which uh, 100 IPs come from the same subnet. It's enough that two IPs were blocked. That could actually uh, make 100 IPs not usable. So that's definitely something that you want to take into account. So when you start using your Illuminati account or any proxy uh, uh, service, you want to start you know, testing out the waters. You start with some given uh, pool size. And uh, if you're not getting to any rate limits, you can actually reduce the pool size until you see that you get to a point where this is just the right amount. And uh, not only that, you want to make sure you uh, manage these IPs. So this is relating to the proxy management we discussed. It's not enough to have the right amount of IPs. If you're using the same IP over and over and not using the others, that means you're probably going to get that IP block pretty quickly. And that's going to harm your data collection operation. You want to make sure you rotate through the different IPs uh, and uh, have that managed as well. This is for the different uh, classifications. Uh, just one last note I wanted to uh, introduce to some of you who maybe don't know it yet, 100% uh, uptime feature, uh, which is uh, enabled by default in all Illuminati uh, accounts today. And basically we put a lot of energy and thought into how to have continuous service. Uh, and we uh, have a very good monitoring system, high level VCs that we work with and servers and vendors and so on. But every now and then things happen that are outside our reach. For example, a data center could have a power outage or an upstream provider, connectivity provider could have a cable cut. And when these things, things happen, we don't want it to affect our customers. So for that, we've just a few months ago introduced the 100% uptime, which is basically a, a fallback system, meaning that each and every one of your IPs has a set of fallback IPs. And in any case we detect a connectivity problem, we will automatically route traffic through one of these fallback IPs, so you should feel basically nothing. Uh, so that's it. If any of you have any questions, then I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, uh, Aviv, yes, we do have questions, and uh, I'm just going to read them uh, loud. Um, 
uh, one of the attendees is asking, what is the average amount of outgoing concurrent connections a server can make on a proxy or, or a proxy can handle? Uh, so on average, we have about, I would say, um, 2,000 requests per second per server. We have a lot of servers. This is just per server. And we usually don't hit, uh, uh, we don't hit the server limit, but it happens, you know, every now and then. And in that case, we will just upgrade the server. Uh, so it'll, it can just increase. But usually it's around 2,000, 2,500 requests per second per server. Uh, thank you. And um, uh, Avinia, she's asking how many regional IP available at the time, like per city, uh, state and country? So that depends per network. For the static residential, we have around 35 countries. For the data center, around 93 or 95. For the residential, pretty much any country in the world. Uh, I've actually just recently had someone ask IPs for sandwich islands, and then I actually did find IPs. So pretty much everywhere. As for the city resolution, I don't have numbers to mention for the different networks, but uh, obviously in the residential network, the peer-to-peer -peer network, it has the widest coverage for that. Um, okay, thank you very much for your questions and for your answers. Uh, if we don't have any more questions, uh, yeah, we have one more question, please. Uh, do you also man uh, manually map the product and audit the product? This is, uh, I guess it is uh, related to collecting product data um, through proxy networks. Can you uh, be more specific about the question? Not sure I understand the question. Uh, do you also manually map the product and audit the product? You mean our product or the? No, uh, I, I think the products that uh, you, uh, that you collect the data about, for example, like uh, you collecting data about the products from the e-commerce side. So competitor product, yeah. Pra, um, it's a question from pra, pra, pradi, pradi, Pradumna. And uh, the question is like about the competitor product. So when we collect the competitor, uh, what you mean, what do we do with it? Yeah. Do it's we map really, it or not? I, I think uh, it is I mean, more it's really, of... it's really up to the uh, user itself. So essentially, you as a user make uh, requests, so you go to a target site, you collect the data, and there's different things you can do with it or manage it, but uh, all the options are open. It's We, we are just a... Uh, uh, we are just an uh, enabler of this. You, you go through our uh, system and we enable you to collect the data, but you need to decide what you want to do with that data. Okay. Uh, another question, uh, how did we collect uh, those 72 million uh, IP addresses? So the residential network, which is the one holding 72 million IPs per month, uh, the source of the IPs is uh, an SDK we have. So we have a, a very large number of partners it could be uh, app owners or desktop apps or uh, smart TVs and so on. Uh, the model in general is that these partners offer their uh, users something uh, like uh, you can either pay for an application or uh, not pay for it, but allow Luminati to use uh, limited resources. Uh, there's there's a, a number of restrictions that uh, their goal is that the user will never feel anything affecting his uh, actual usage or uh, uh, internet package, so we cannot use it if it's uh, not connected to Wi-Fi, to the computer, and not in sleep mode, and so on. And um, this way, we have uh, uh, different peers connecting to our system, and we th these IPs are basically what uh, what is the residential network. So we go through these peers. Uh, also, a uh, similar question, do, do, do we manage the traffic to our website to prevent the kind of a DDoS attack, or is this a responsibility of the user who created the scrape? We do have different restrictions. We have uh, uh, rate limits for all of our servers, so even if some user tries to uh, make a DDoS attack, he will not be able to because there's just a a, a set of different rate limitations for different scenarios that will prevent him from doing that. 
And of course, if we detect that someone did it or tried to do it, but they failed, we will of course immediately uh, disable his account and also investigate and improve our uh, onboarding and KYC process. So we will not onboard such customers in the future. Uh, the next question is a fallback, um, fallback option an additional service and can or and can it be enabled on any proxy setup, for example, data center IPs? The 100% uptime, the fallback system, which I described, is currently available for the data center network and for the static residential network. It's enabled by default. It doesn't have any cost. It's just a better service kind of feature. Uh, what you can do if you want is disable it. And uh, some users want to have always the same IP, even if the cost of the IP is not working in, in some cases. So they can just disable it. Also, if you make a request and you mention a specific IP that you want to target, we will not use the fallback system. We will assume that you need the specific IP, but any other scenario, the 100% uptime or the fallback will work and it's completely free. It doesn't require making any changes in your code or anything else. It just, it's fully automated. Uh, thank you very much. We still have uh, some questions, uh, which we will answer you uh, in the chat. And uh, after the, this uh, uh, workshop is over, uh, but we have to carry on with our agenda. And now I want to introduce uh, Chris, uh, product uh, manager of uh, our proxy manager um, product. And Chris, please, uh, and now it's uh, time for you to tell how exactly we are managing this uh, huge amount of proxies and how you can do it in automated manner. Thank you for the introduction, Anna. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris, um, and I'm an engineer who works for Luminati for over three years. I'm also um, a product owner of Luminati Proxy Manager, which is a tool that I'm going to be talking about today. And um, it's a tool that uh, allows you to, for the automation of the proxy management. So Luminati Proxy Manager, or uh, LPM as we call it, uh, is a tool that you install either on your machine locally or somewhere on the server. And it's a one entry point for all the proxy operations. What it means, uh, it means that uh, you don't need to um, integrate multiple vendors, for example. You don't need to take care of the authentication. Uh, there's a lot of hustle, hustle around the integrating uh, proxy providers, even if it's just one, just Luminati. Um, it also uh, shows you a live preview of all the requests that you are sending. It gathers the statistics. Um, it has multiple very powerful um, features, tools like rules, which allow you for automatically retrying failed requests or uh, skipping some requests to save the bandwidth. So I will be showing you, I will be introducing you to the um, to this tool, this uh, amazing tool. And it actually doesn't matter if you are a beginner, just started scraping or you're an advanced scraper. Uh, it has uh, an added value for, for everybody. Uh, so just to give you a mental map for to better understand what, what it actually is, uh, as you can see in the slide, is kind of an extra layer in between the crawler and super proxy, where crawler is uh, your end client. It might be the browser or might be some custom piece of software that you have. Uh, on the other side is super proxy or might be an uh, other external provider or multiple of them. All right, so the major part of the presentation is live demo. I, I prepared four uh, little practices for you. But before that, uh, I'm going to switch to my virtual machine. Uh, hopefully, you can see it right now. Um, I'm using Ubuntu Linux, but uh, Luminati Proxy Manager works on uh, all the major operating systems like uh, Windows, uh, Mac OS, and uh, multiple distributions of Linux. I'm running on Linux, so it's just a matter of running an LPM or Luminati command in the terminal. It takes a few seconds to start up, and then you can see the, um, the information that you can open admin browser under localhost on port 22999. So this is, I already prepared for it, I, I, I have it opened. Uh, this is the UI, this is the overview of, of the LPM. 
So here you will see all the you will you will see the operations that you, you that you have. Um, now this is the welcoming page. You don't see much here just because we just started. And but let us let me click the big button start and uh, walk uh, through the uh, inst like the creation of uh, proxy port process. I will I will leave the default options uh, for now. Create proxy port, and that's it. I created port twenty four o o o. I can see it behind the model here, and also. Uh, this is the live preview of all the requests. So I can now grab the command. The command is curl command to proxy my request through localhost on the port, exactly the same port that I created, uh, and sending the request to loomtest.com slash myip.json. So let me copy it and paste in the terminal. And that's it. I'm not sure if you were paying attention uh, to this part of the screen, but uh, let me send this the same uh, request again. As you can see, you can um, the request pops up here right away immediately, even uh, without even before it uh, succeeds. You can see the request in the pending state, and then uh, the updated in the black font the request uh, which was uh, succeeded. Um, so I can see it here the response to the request. Let me do it again from scratch. Uh, yeah, so the response is here. Um, for some people, it might be handy to, to, to preview either in the terminal or maybe you have already some uh, preview implemented in your piece of software. Uh, but in general, I think it's really, really, really handy to uh, to have this preview in here in the HAR viewer. Um, Partially because most of you are already probably familiar with the with with the widget because it's um, taken almost one to one from uh, Google Chrome Developers Tools uh, networking tab, and you can see all the all the, like the the whole response, the preview, and the basic information about the requests, like what peer IP was used for sending this request, the authentication against super proxy. Um, obviously, the status code, the URL, but also all the response headers and request headers, timing uh, of the request, and so on. All right, but let me uh, focus on the practices that I prepared for you today. So, um, the first one is to open a new port in the LPM, which we already did, set it with the targeting to Germany, and then uh, I will show you really quick how to uh, open a web browser, which is already connected to the proxy port. So you don't need to have any extra configuration. It just uh, works out of the box. And I will open the browser and I, I will verify that I'm connecting from Germany. So let's do it. Um, also on the right hand side, I, I forgot to mention, you you will have the statistics, but I will I will talk about it uh, a little bit later. Okay, so let's, uh, let's click on the port 24000, which moves us to um, the configuration page. And then under targeting tab from the country uh, drop down, I can uh, choose Germany and it's just uh, just the, the matter of a few clicks. Now my proxy port is configured to to, to connecting from Germany. Uh, this little button browse is opening a browser. It's Puppeteer, which is built in LPM. Um, and this browser is already using uh, LPM. I will turn on SSL analyzing, which will I will also talk a bit later about. And in logs, I, I can see the live preview of all the requests, which is kind of cool that I, I will be typing something and I will be going to the website. You will see everything in the preview. So let me examine uh, where I'm connecting from by going to the website called whatismyippro.com. All right, so it says I'm connecting from Germany, which is fine. This is exactly what I wanted. On the left hand side, you can you could see multiple requests. That's because uh, one page load requires uh, uh, multiple subsequent requests like uh, libraries, JavaScript libraries or uh, images. Um, now, uh, let me ch uh, change to, Bur to whatever other country like Brazil, hit refresh. And you can see it was so easy, like two seconds and I, I 
changed my location where I'm connecting from. All right, so that's it. That was the first practice, a really simple one. Um, let's move on. Let's uh, talk about uh, IP rotation. So uh, the very basic breakdown uh, of uh, the proxy operation may be that there are two categories. All the proxy operations may fall, fall down into, into two main categories. The first one is where you are connecting from the browser and you're performing um, some kind of a session. So let's say you are going to uh, some e-commerce or social media website, then uh, you authenticate yourself. Uh, you're giving the credentials, you log in, then you can verify some kind of maybe advert advertisement or um, you, you're checking some price, whatever you want, whatever your, your business requires, and then you log out. And only after that, you want to rotate the IP. So during the session, you want to use the same IP uh, for all the subsequent requests. Why? Uh, because otherwise it would be super easy for the target site to detect uh, suspicious traffic, something unusual. Um, if, you are a, if you are a real person, browsing internet, performing some actions, you are connecting most of the times from a one IP. It happens in real life that uh, your IP changes. If you are losing con connectivity to, to your local network or you're um, mm, traveling and you're switching the IPs, um, but it's very rare and for sure it's not like rotating on each request. So to be a real person for the target site, you need to, per you need to per persist the IP. On the other hand, it's a completely on the other side. Uh, it's a completely opposite uh, use case when um, you're scraping some endpoints on some API. Then it's not from the browser. Most likely, it's from some kind of kind of a bot or your custom software. You are sending single requests, and each request should be uh, done from a different API. Just because if you are sending hundreds of them or even thousands of them. Uh, you want to hide your identity. You don't want to be seen as a one person. You want to be seen as uh, as many people as, as possible. Uh, again, to not, not to get blocked. So how it's done using uh, the LPM? Very easy. It's so common to switch be to, to use either one, either long single session or rotating uh, that we decided to make it uh, as simple as just choosing uh, one value from the dropdown. So by default, if you create a proxy port, it chooses. It uses a long single session. Um, how it works in practice? Uh, that if I keep refreshing the website, I will see the same IP over and over. You can see that one eight one and uh, persists. No, no matter how many times I refresh the page, it persists. In some cases, when you are using residential and real connections from real people, it sometimes may get changed just because there is no nothing else to do because the peer becomes offline. So this is very specific case when we can't uh, persist the, the AP, but this is fine. As I said before, uh, real people also sometimes occasionally change the AP. But, but for example, in static uh, network like data center or um, static residential, uh, we provide you with uh, the same IP over and over. And of course, you want to change it sometimes after you perform the session. So you can you can change it from the UI by clicking this little icon. Now it will get changed. There is also an API and other methods, but it's up to you when it changes. Uh, the other example that I gave you with scraping some APIs um, is uh, is better to use rotating IPs. And in this case. Uh, Every time I refresh the page, I will get a I will I will get a new IP. And actually, behind the scene, this page uh, loads. Uh, this, this this page requires me to send over 30 requests, and each request is sent from a different IP. So for for this target site, it's it's very easy to detect that I'm not a real person. But uh, uh, of course, you will be sending uh, these requests from the uh, not from the browser. All right, so as you can see, it's just a matter of uh, two clicks to change from IP rotation to, to keeping the same IP. Let me get back to the presentation and move on to the next practice. 
So next practice is uh, uh, introducing the rules, which is a really, really powerful mechanism in LPM, probably one of the most important uh, part of the LPM. And um, it's a generic mechanism. So it's a mechanism where you define a trigger and an action. Trigger might be based on uh, status code. It can, it can rely on the, the time, the, the, the whole uh, journey of the request, the total response time. It can rely on uh, some part of the response. It can scan the, the response HTML. And for example, if it, if it detects some like text captcha, then it can trigger the rule. And the action might be also, uh, it, it can vary. Um, we have, uh, we, we can ban an IP, retry the same request. We can skip the request. It's up to the use case. I will introduce you to the two most common use cases. The first one is uh, retrying on failed requests. Okay, so I will set a rule to retry on a request. If the status code is 502. So let's get to, to the LPM again. Uh, I will move back to long symbol session because I don't want to rotate automatically. I mean, on each request, I, I want to rotate only uh, based on the rule. So this rule is so common that we decided to give you a preset. Uh, it, it's a shortcut for creation, this rule. Retry failed requests. I, if I click it, it will open the whole configuration of the rule. So it says that if status code of the, of the response is starting with either four or five, then it's going to retry with a new IP. But I wanted to, to retry only on status code 502. Then I can customize this rule. And now, uh, now it's uh, exactly what I wanted. Uh, and I can examine if it works in my browser. So I, I will click clear the logs so it's easier to see what's going on. And um, there is an API called HTTP stats.us and slash whatever comes after the slash, whatever number, it becomes the status code of the response. So for example, if I'm going, if I'm uh, requesting this URL, HTTP stats.us slash 200, then it's a super, super simple answer. Just 200 okay with status code 200. And I can see it here. Uh, it's just for the sake of the test. Uh, of course, it's not, there, it's, it's not a real uh, life example. Nobody wants to scrape uh, this API. It's for the testing. So now if I want to force seeing 502 response, the easiest option is to fetch this URL. And now we can see something happened. There's a little green arrow in the uh, on the left hand side of the URL. If I click it, I can see that under rules tab, there is some rule triggered. And in the timing tab, it's obvious that the rule was applied. So the first request was sent. It took 703 milliseconds. And then after that, um, LPM noticed that the status code is 502. So the, it, 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 it decided to retry with a new IP. And in a real life example, uh, if you rotate the, the fingerprint, um, the IP and maybe some uh, headers, then uh, hopefully you will get uh, you get the the response, the desired data. Okay, so let me close it and let's get back to the presentation. Uh, let's move on to the final practice that I prepared for you today, and it's also utilizing rules. In this case, we are gonna optimize the bandwidth. Um, so I will create two proxy ports. I will, will, I will leave the first proxy port with the default, default configuration for the benchmark. So to see the, the comparison. And in the second proxy port, I will define a rule to skip loading images, um, all, Im all the images and media types. And I will load the same website using these two proxy ports and compare the results. So let's do it. It's gonna be a really interesting practice. I want to start from scratch. So I'm removing this proxy port to leave the previous configuration and starting from scratch, creating a new proxy port. I can call it a, a benchmark. Uh, so e in the overview, I can see that this proxy port is a benchmark. I can duplicate it just by clicking this little icon. And the second proxy port I'm going to call uh, cost optimization. 
And here I need to enable SSL analyzing, which allows LPM to read the data. And again, it's just a sake of uh, clicking one button, save bandwidth. It's so common that we decided to, to make it super simple to set up. And under the hood, I can see that uh, based on some URL, in this case, in, in this example, it's uh, just URL is an extension, PNG, JPG, JPEG, and so on. So it's, it's media types. If URL is one of these, then you can either bypass proxy or you can skip loading the, this request. You can give the null response. Uh, so we'll show you the both, uh, how, how both of the action works. Mm, all right, so this is already working. I can, all, of course, customize it, but let's leave it for now. And I'm going to open one browser connected to the benchmark proxy port with no special configuration, just proxying whole traffic. And the second uh, browser connected to the second proxy port with the rule defined from for for bandwidth optimization and cost optimization. And I'm going to open the same website, Instagram.com, in both of the browsers. All right. So as you can see uh, on the right hand side, I can we, we have a regular landing page of uh, Instagram.com, which is fine. On the left hand side, though, we have very similar website, uh, similarly looking, but there's no images on it. So this is exactly what we wanted. We skipped loading images. On average, it will be faster to load the same website without images. Uh, but most importantly, we spent less uh, traffic, so we will pay less uh, for the for the proxy. Mm. And in there's multiple cases where you're scraping uh, some e-commerce, for example, and uh, the only thing you're really interested in is to, to see the inputs, to pass the credentials, and then verify some some tiny part of the of their website. It might be the price, it might be the title, uh, the advertisement, um, but you don't really need all those images, all those, uh, I don't know, um, icons. Uh, so it might be really, really huge um, save for you. Uh, okay, I promised also to talk a little bit about uh, bypassing proxy. So now I will close those browsers and uh, I will modify this rule not to give null response, but to bypass proxy. And let's open again Instagram.com. And I'm going to go to the overview to see what happens in the in, in the logs, in the statistics. OK, so uh, again, it's a regular, regular landing page of, of Instagram.com. So what interesting happened here? Uh, the interesting part of uh, what happened here is that um, part of the website was loaded by using the proxy and part of the website was loaded using my local network. And this is kind of a combination of uh, it's, 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 it's having both advantages of uh, having proxy because I won't get detected and I still see the images because I might be still interested in seeing the images. It's, it's easier to navigate. And in the statistics, I can see that uh, there is saved bandwidth. I saved over 300 kilobytes just by loading one page. So imagine how much you can save by loading hundreds or thousands uh, uh, web pages. Cool. So this is uh, this is the last. It was the last uh, practice for you today. Let me get back to the presentation. Uh, and I have one more thing I wanted to, to discuss today. Uh, I've been asked uh, recently a lot of times about scalability. So Aviv and Tamir told you about the beauty of our network. It's uh, so well distributed. And now I'm saying, I'm telling you guys to put one bottleneck, uh, which is called the Luminati Proxy Manager. And I'm, for, I'm convincing you to point your whole operation, your, your, all your traffic to one, this one, one point, making it a bottleneck. Um, of course, it's not the case. There are solutions. So if your business is scaling up, then um, LPM will also scale up automatically in the beginning. So if you're 
if you have a machine with four CPUs, then it will automatically out of the box with no configuration extra required. It will utilize all of the CPUs. It will create four. Uh, it will create one worker per one CPU that you that you have on your machine. So basically, if you are having trouble sending the requests, if you're if you feel that you are hitting the um, the limits then it's just the, the, a matter of upgrading your machine to have more CPUs, more memory maybe, and then it will utilize it automatically. Of course, up to some point, 64 CPUs is a common machine, but it's some, sometimes it might be expensive, uh, or maybe you don't have an access to such a machine, then uh, you can start scaling horizontally. In this case, it's a little bit more difficult because you it requires from you a little bit extra work. Uh, probably you need some technical guidance to set up uh, multiple machines next to each other uh, and put a, a, a load balancer in front of them, for example, Nginx. But there's also a third option, uh, which is called Cloud Proxy Manager. We've been serving with this product for the last over three months. and um, this is basically the LPM, the same pro proxy manager, but hosted by us on our server or servers. And in this case, you don't care about the, you don't need to think even of the scalability. Uh, this is our responsibility. So we watch the traffic, we monitor it, and we can also offer some help with the uh, configuring it. And uh, it, it happens out of the box. It's the, all the magic is on us. And uh, I highly encourage you guys to check it out. Um, you can go to luminati.io slash cp slash LPM to get more information about that. I'm also happy to answer uh, any questions right now regarding Luminati Proxy Manager or, or Cloud Proxy Manager. Thank you, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you, Chris. It was uh, really interesting, especially watching the practice in, in live. Uh, we have uh, several questions and I'm going to read them now. Uh, we have a um, question, uh, how do uh, we rotate the IP after a certain amount of requests? Uh, of course, so uh, there is multiple uh, options. You can, uh, as I, I showed during my demo, I clicked little icon, but of course it's a manual work. So if you want to have uh, automated uh, uh, operation, which is all about, this, this presentation is all about, uh, you don't want to do any manual uh, operations. There is an API, uh, so LPM can uh, expose an API uh, where you just hit the endpoint and it refreshes the IP. So you can, def the logic is up to you. You can do it every X requests, you can do it every X amount of seconds, uh, but basically in real life, you don't want to rotate every X seconds. You want to rotate as soon as your session is finished. So LPM doesn't know, it can't know when your session is finished. So you need to, Tell LPM where you're when when you're done with uh, one session and you want to start another one. Uh, thank you. When you use a Python scraper and create an SSL connection, are there some things to keep in mind? To configure. Um, not really. You can use it out of the box, but if you want to utilize uh, some of the features like rules, and if you want to let the LPM read the data, incoming and, and outcoming data, then uh, you want SSL analyzing. And then you need to either trust the DLPM's certificate or uh, just ignore certificate errors on your side. Uh, thank you. As, uh, as you say, residential IPs are very hard to block and detect, but still some site blocks and detect 100% even for residential IPs. How can we tackle this? Uh, so this is a good question. Um, residential connections are real people's connections. So in theory, uh, they shouldn't be blocked. Uh, but if you're sending requests, you may forget about uh, rotating user agent. You may forget about um, TLS protocol. And uh, actually most of the presentation which Josh is uh, prepared for you today is about active and passive fingerprinting. Uh, but the short answer is that uh, it's, regard it's related to the fingerprinting. So you need to take care of uh, 
rotating your user agent using the right protocol, or uh, you can um, rely on us and uh, uh, Josh will introduce you to the Unblocker and data collection products. Uh, what are the signs that you hit the limit? Mm, if the response time is, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that you're asking about the limits, limitations of Luminati Proxy Manager. So uh, it's very easy that uh, you can see the response time is getting uh, longer and longer, or maybe it doesn't respond at all. Uh, Luminati, Proxy Manager, Luminati Proxy Manager is just a process. It can get overloaded. You can see that CPU is at 100%, uh, or maybe you're running out of memory. Okay, thank you. And uh, another question is, if a crawler has own configurations, request headers, uh, user agents, is it all overrided by uh, Luminati Proxy Manager configurations? It's a great question. So by default, Luminati Proxy Manager doesn't overwrite anything, but as long, actually, I can switch back to the to the LP and then I can show you. Um, under Headers tab, if you turn on SSL Analyzing, which means you let DLPM manipulate with the request, um, you can choose, you can let LPM override, for example, a user agent with some specific user agent or random user agent. And in this case, LPM will always override um, whatever comes. I mean, if you even if your original request will have user agent curl, it will use some random user user agent. Thank you. And the last question that we have, it's uh, oh, I, where- I, I, just I just realized that I, I wasn't sharing my screen, but basically uh, <laughs> in, in the LPM under headers tab, you can define the headers. Okay, so, but it's, it's optional. You can override and you can leave it as it is, right? Right. Yes. So, and the last question is where can we find the documentation for, for the APIs? Uh, it's uh, on luminati.io slash FAQ. Uh, I'm sorry, either FAQ or there is another special uh, URL. Uh, uh, I will send this it's, URL it's, it's, in it's the under, chat. It's, it's under uh, FAQ. Yeah, I will, I will, uh, yeah, we are going to send website. this uh, URL in the chat so everyone can uh, find the APS uh, on that link. So uh, thank you very much for your questions and thank you very much for your answers, Chris. And we are moving on with our um, agenda to the next speaker, Josh van der Willek, the product thank manager you. for uh, Unblocker and uh, data collection automation uh, uh, platform. And now uh, all, most of the questions is going to be answered. What uh, do we do when we are getting blocked and what can we do beyond the IP infrastructure and the uh, proxy management? Josh? Hi, everyone. Um, as Chris mentioned, uh, the, the connections you use are not the only part that uh, matters when you're collecting data online. So. Uh, I'm the product manager of the Unblocker and the data collection automation uh, products at Luminati. And these products are both focused on helping you solve the fingerprinting problem. So a residential IP might look exactly like a normal uh, household IP, but if the site that you're talking to can still read patterns in your traffic, then they can still detect that it's you even though your connection is correct. So um, just a brief high level overview. Uh, Unblocker is kind of an intelligent proxy that we uh, developed to reshape your traffic as you send it. So if you're sending incorrect headers or you're not sending from or you're not rotating IPs correctly, then Unblocker will attempt to fix the problems on the fly without your application needing to change. So it's like a drop in replacement for your existing system. Um, the data collection automation platform we developed because there are some types of blocking that are too sophisticated to handle. Uh, on the fly in one connection like this. So the, the data collection platform we have is built to take the scraping or the, the data collection off of your hands completely, and we will manage it end to end. So when you talk about fingerprinting, there are some, there's a, there's a golden rule, which is you need to pick an example that your application is trying to look like, and you need to unify everything that you can to that example. You don't change things randomly. You measure the real world to see what it looks like, and then you make sure that your application looks like the real world. 
So an example of this is the headers that you use. Uh, if you say use Chrome 84 to browse a website, Chrome 84 is going to be sending some headers when you load a page for the first time. You need to be sending these headers if your application is trying to load a page for the first time. If Chrome 84 is not sending particular headers, then you can't be sending these headers because that makes you different from Chrome 84. Um, this is a mistake I see quite frequently. Uh, people don't pay attention to when headers appear because not every page load is exactly the same. When you arrive on a website for the first time, you will get one set of headers. And if you reload the page, you will get a different set of headers and an image request will get a different set of headers. So you need to pay attention to which headers are being sent for the specific request that you're trying to imitate. So in this example, uh, a new page load will not receive or will not send a cache control header, but a reloaded page will. So I often see people build uh, data collection systems using the cache control header because they're doing their development and they have the dev tools in their browser open and they see the cache control header. But it doesn't occur to them that the cache control header is only there because they've been reloading the page for testing multiple times. Um, the order of headers that you send can be used to measure if you are a real browser. Because Chrome 84, for example, will send all of their headers in a very specific order. And if your application is claiming to be Chrome 84, but the headers that you're sending are in a different order than Chrome 84 sends them, then a smart website can take a look at that and make a guess that you're not really Chrome 84, because if you were, you would be sending them in the correct order. So by default, the dev tools will show you the headers in an alphabetized list. And if you click view source, you can view the um, something much closer to the real traffic that's sent. This is a, an example where even though there's the view source option and you can check what you think is the real order, the only 100% reliable way to know this for sure is to use a tool like Wireshark to, uh, to inspect the traffic going through the network because uh, you can't always trust that your tools are giving you an honest answer. And we'll review, uh, we'll review something about that later. So the protocols that you use are also important. Uh, if a website supports HTTP2, which is like, um, it's a new version of HTTP designed to stream multiple requests over one connection. If it's available and you're running a browser that supports it, then the browser will use it. This means if you're running Chrome 84, then Chrome 84 will actually use HTTP2 if it's available on your target website. However, most data collection applications don't use HTTP2 because it's harder to implement and it's easy to use the default request module that you're, that you're importing into your code. The issue is, since it's supported on the website and it's available, or since it's supported on the website and since the browser that you're claiming to be would use it if it was available, then the fact that you're not using it is odd. And it's a little bit hard to detect, uh, but some websites can detect this and can decide that you're not really the, the browser that you're saying you are. Um, when you're using HTTP2, one thing to note is that the headers change almost completely. You see the, uh, the case changes, they're all lowercase now. And there are these new special headers, authority, method, path, and scheme. Uh, going back to the example I talked about earlier, we found a bug when we were developing the unblocker proxy, because we're using Node.js, where these four headers were being sent on the network in the opposite order that we had them listed in our code, just due to the way the internal HTTP2 Node.js module works. So we thought we were doing one thing, but we weren't measuring the real world. So in reality, we were doing something different. So this ended up being the result of some blocking. And once we fixed it, the blocking went away. Um, when you make a TLS connection to a website, Chrome 84, as for example, will make a connection with a particular set of ciphers because you know Chrome on Windows will have some certain cryptographic ciphers that it supports. And they will also have a bunch of extensions to the TLS protocol that they support. The ciphers that you support, the TLS version, and all of the extensions are not going to be the same by default if you just use something like well, Python SSL connections or um, just your standard uh, requesting module. This one is its harder to detect from the client website because they need to integrate fingerprinting software deeper into their web application stack, but some websites do uh, do this. Uh, it's also much harder to fix from a code standpoint because you 
this is not like a common module that exists and you have to do a little bit of custom building. In our case, we actually extracted the, um, the SSL connection libraries outside of Chrome and made them uh, a part of our proxy. So our, our unblocker proxy will actually make a, an, a TLS connection exactly like Google Chrome would make a TLS connection. So uh, we have a demo of this. We built a website. It's not a, a fully reliable finger printer, but it just checks for some of these things to see if it looks correct. So it's like a good um, sanity test for you, I think. Botcheck.luminati.io. If I reload this page, you will see, first of all, that cache control is listed in a tricky header list. And you will also see that uh, it passes all of the checks. So the user agent is correct. The header values are right. The TLS version is right. The HTTP2 settings we're using are correct because this is a real browser, so this would make sense. And if I move now to curl, and I do the same thing, curl botcheck.luminati.io, you see fail, because the user agent wasn't what was expected. And if I add the dash V flag, actually, maybe I can make this a little bigger. I'm not sure if it's very visible. Edit preferences. So if I add the dash V flag, we can see that the request that was sent looks like this. And you'll see the user agent is listed as curl, which is obviously not a real browser. So you might say that the way to fix this is to go to the network tab and we'll take the user agent that Chrome is sending. Let's try it. So if I go to headers and I scroll down here and I go to user agent, we'll copy this value. And then we'll send the same curl request as before except we will add user agent and the user agent that we have from our Chrome request. So now the outgoing request looks like this. And the response is that it's a fail, a lot of fails. So the user agent was right, but now all of the header values we're sending are not right. Uh, we didn't send the correct accept header. The TLS version wasn't correct. We're not using HTTP2. Uh, the TLS ciphers were wrong. So you might say, why don't we just copy the request as curl? We can copy everything the browser is sending and we'll send it the same. So let's try it. So you see all of the headers that the browser would be sending. And when we run it, we see that it's still a fail. And the reason for this in this case is because the browser is making this request over HTTP2 and curl is making this request over HTTP1. So nothing really lines up between the two of them. You can make curl uh, request over HTTP2, and you can fix. You can find a version of curl that uses the correct uh, TLS version. Probably you won't find a version of curl that uses the right TLS ciphers. But this is just an example of um, if you're not carefully considering your code, it can it can go wrong without you noticing. So, uh, oh, hold on, I had another demo. If we make the same request to botcheck.luminati.io using our unblocker proxy, let's do a clear and we paste. So you'll notice that the request was only specifying a proxy port, uh, a proxy server, a proxy user, and we're allowing the proxy to intercept the TLS connection and make changes and the URL and everything passed. The target site, in this case, our own fingerprinting site, didn't realize that anything was out of order. All right, so that's for uh, passive fingerprinting. And our unblocker proxy will fix things like the headers that you send. It will pick the right TLS protocol. It will pick the right HTTP2 version or the HTTP version for the site that you're talking to. If the site that you're talking to only supports HTTP1, we'll pick that automatically. But if it supports HTTP2, then that's also uh, what we'll pick. Uh, we have some retry logic inside of Unblocker. So if you make a request to a site and we are able to read from the response content that the answer the site gave you is a block, we will make some changes to the request and we will retry it under the hood, uh, trying to get you to 100% success rate without your code needing to handle this uh, on your side. If you're dealing with a target that is more advanced, you might be uh, using a full browser. Full browsers are much more complicated to get right. They have a lot more attributes, they have a lot more uh, technologies inside of them, and they have a lot more points that you can measure. And the more things you can measure about a system, the easier it is to get one thing wrong. 
So active fingerprinting is when a site will send you some JavaScript or change their behavior in order to measure something about your response to it. So maybe they'll send some JavaScript library into your browser to measure a bunch of properties and send back a report, or maybe they will redirect you through a flow of pages, which doesn't have any purpose other than to see how your connection and your headers and everything about your browser changes between requests. Um, the way that you interact with the page can be used to measure who you really are. Like if you're a real user and you go to some search site, you'll navigate to ecommerce.com. You'll click on the search bar, you'll type in your query, you'll press enter, and then you'll scroll down the page until you see some link you like, and then you'll click the link. Uh, an automated browser like Puppeteer, by default, if you're not careful, will do something like navigate to the search page, click on the URL, type your query much faster than any real user ever would, click on uh, search, jump down on the page directly to the link that you care about and click it. And you're missing the scrolling and you're missing the smooth typing. Uh, and if, if a site is watching for this, this can be used to, to detect that it's not a real uh, browser and not a real user. Some sites will abuse edge cases in uh, common protocols just to see how your browser responds to it. So for example, we found one site which was sending a deliberately malformed cookie because Chrome by default will take this invalid character in the cookie and expand it to four spaces. And Node.js, which is what we were using, will refuse to process the request completely. And if you enable a kind of relaxed parsing of the cookie, then it will expand it to one space. So in this case, you, you can see that uh, the real browser will send back a different answer than our own data collection system, even if everything else was correct, just because we're handling a, an error in how the site is sending us a cookie in a different way than the browser is set, uh, handling it. Some sites will append uh, some kind of identifier to your local storage to track your browser between sessions. So you need to make sure that your uh, you, whenever you are changing to a new kind of logical session, so if you do a search and you click on a product and you collect the info about the product data and you want to do this for a new product, this would be a point where you would want to change your IP, clear your browser storage, uh, maybe pick a different user agent, uh, something about making sure it's a new logical session and everything is different from this one, or everything is different in this session. Um, if your browser, or if you're using a real browser, some websites will check for WebRTC IP links. WebRTC is a technology that uh, allows browsers to stream data between each other. And this streaming happens over the UDP protocol, not the TCP protocol. And the consequence of this is that the traffic does not go through your configured proxy connection. This can be used to leak the IP that your browser is actually sitting at and skip your proxy network completely. So you need to make sure that your, your WebRTC settings in your browser are configured to route your traffic through your proxy. The naive answer to this problem might be to disable WebRTC completely, but this is not a valid approach because as we covered earlier, we, we can't change things randomly. We have to align everything we're doing to the real world. And a real user doesn't have WebRTC disabled on average. And if you're different from the average real user, that's at least one data point that can be used to remove you from the crowd. And if they have maybe two or three data points that can remove you from the crowd, then they can identify you specifically. Canvas fingerprinting is another technique like this that is very, very common. Um, the target site will send some code to your browser that will draw a picture in your browser. And the result of this picture this, the pixel specific values will depend on the graphics hardware you have installed and possibly the fonts that you have installed. And these things are difficult to change. So most people don't have any defense for this. Um, you need to experiment with this to see how to solve it correctly. It can be different uh, for every site, uh, depending on what behavior the site expects. Um, one answer could be to add noise to your uh, to your graphics canvases uh, just to make the result different every time they draw a picture. Uh, another answer might be to install an extension that changes your canvas properties. Uh, it's something that you need to test and to see if it has any impact. The window size you use can matter because the average real user is going to be on probably a laptop, a phone, or a desktop. 
Phones have a bunch of specific standard sizes. Laptops are usually 1366 by 768 or 1920 by 1080. And Puppeteer by default, as an example, will launch by, at 600 by 800. And it's not invalid to browse the website or it's not invalid to browse the internet at 800 by 600, but it's different from what most people normally do. And that can mean that you're detected because you're not part of the crowd anymore. If all of this sounds like a headache and we've been building a platform to fix this so we know for sure that it is a headache, you can let us take this burden for you. Uh, our data collection automation platform allows you to specify what data you want to collect and how you want it to be delivered. And then we handle the crawling completely. Uh, we manage the browsers, we manage the proxies, uh, everything. So I can show you a demo of how it works. Let's say that I wanted to go to amazon.com and search for coffee. And what I care about are finding the products that are on the first page of the uh, Amazon search results for coffee. So what I can do in the uh, data collection platform is to define a new collector, Amazon coffee, www.amazon.com, and we want product search results. So we'll click create. You can have this collector run on any schedule that you define. So if you wanted to run it only on Mondays uh, at 3.41 PM, and you can have it repeat every day, or maybe you want it to be from 8 AM to uh, 6 PM on weekdays, it's up to you. You can pick the schedule. Or if you want more detailed control, you can, in, you can trigger the collector manually through a JSON API, which is what we'll do in this case, because I don't want the schedule. So you can pick if you want the results in JSON or CSV, in my case, JSON, and you can have it delivered by email, webhook, delivered to some cloud storage bucket or to an uh, FTP server. If what you want isn't listed here, please let us know and we can take a look. So now if I click trigger and I search for coffee, I want, let's say one page of results and let's do United States. So I've triggered a crawl on our system and in the background we're using head, we're using a pool of browsers to actually crawl this page and parse out the search results and to collect a data set for you. And uh, once it's ready, it'll be displayed here on the screen. Looks like it should be done in a couple seconds now. We also have retry functionality built into this system. So if something fails, then we will try it again in the background to see if we can get it. So the results have finished collecting and you can see that we have all of the search results. We have the title, we've got the rating, the, the number of reviews, the price. So that's that for me. Um, if you want us to handle the load, then we can do that and you can make your data collection system quite a bit simpler. So uh, uh, now we are at the question and answer section. Uh, thank you, George. Uh, amazing uh, demo. We have a couple of questions. Uh, let me just read them. Uh, do you think a headless browser solves some of these issues? Yes, headless browsers, especially in the passive fingerprinting section we discussed, headless browsers will solve some of these issues because a headless browser will connect like a real browser. So kind of by definition, it's correct. Headless browsers are more complicated and more expensive to run, especially at scale. So uh, it's, it's kind of a cost question, but, and also once you get into the complex fingerprinting cases, headless browsers fall apart because headless Chrome doesn't have the same, if you know what to look for, headless Chrome does not have the same fingerprint as um, real Chrome. Okay. Uh, is there a list of the web pages that uh, DCA supports, data collection uh, yes. automation supports? We have support for uh, Amazon right now. Uh, we have and a bunch of other, uh, mostly online e-retail or uh, like peer-to-peer -peer purchasing sites. Uh, we very soon will be launching a self-serve platform so that you can configure 
uh, whatever site you want on your own and it's uh, it'll be quite simple that's coming probably in the next one to two weeks okay uh, next question if we need to select some options on a product page before scraping the price for instance is it achievable through the unblocker if the options that you need to select are embedded within the URL and you can send a request and uh, the URL contains all the, the information the website needs to display to you the correct page, then yes, you can do this through Unblocker. If you need to interact with the page in some, in some way, like loading the page and clicking on some buttons to show a, pay, a product variant, then this is something that you would need to use the data collection platform for. Okay, uh, dear friends, we, we have uh, more time to answer your questions. Please uh, go ahead and uh, let us know uh, what other questions do you have about the uh, digital fingerprint. Okay, uh, I can see a question from Matthew. Uh, he's asking, how about sites, uh, how can they block and give you different? You by checking the cookies for that or shared cookie. One, one second, Matthew, let me read it because I don't understand the question. Uh, how about sites that uh, can block you, give you different information by checking your cookies for that app site or shared cookies and looking for existing behavior, behavioral history on the site, etc. Does this come up often and can your unblocker get around this? I think the question is talking about the case where um, the site is using the cookie to match your browsing to a particular user session, and then they're inspecting the history of that user section to decide if, uh, if it's a bot or not. This is a fairly advanced um, blocking case, and it's, it's difficult to solve correctly because you need to make a, a scraping or a, a data collection system that has a consistent fingerprint over time and uses the same IP over time and the same session over time. Um, Unblocker is not really tailored to solve these types of problems because it's a very big and complex problem. Mostly Unblocker is, is very good at uh, loading one page and then loading another page and loading a bunch of pages at a high volume because it's very good at randomizing the fingerprint of the uh, of the requests. Maintaining consistency like this over a long time period is, is quite difficult. Okay. Um, another question is, can we apply uh, DCA for Amazon in other languages? You mean like Amazon.fr? Mm, uh, I think uh, the question is more about like uh, languages like Japanese or um, there should be no reason that we can't support this in the system. If you if your requirements are that you need to get it get the results with, um, let's say Amazon.co.jp, or if you want to get results in Japanese by selecting the uh, the Japanese language in the dropdown, this is all something we can support. Okay. Um... How to identify which browser fingerprints a particular site is using to block or detect? Some of this will come down to experimentation. You need to use the scientific method. So usually when you're dealing with blocking, you will have some base case that is working. Probably it'll be a, a real browser on your Chrome or on your Windows machine, something like this. And then on the other side, you have your, your experimental case, which is your own data collection system, and it's not working. If you measure the traffic that you're sending, you will see differences between the two of these. And if you are methodical about it, you can change, you can find the differences and then fix the differences one by one. And eventually you'll get to a point where uh, either it's working now or the traffic is identical between the two of them and then it will be working. And uh, another question is, are there plans on building an unblocker for headless browsers, uh, yes. which may inject JavaScript to modify the reaction of the headless browser or so to circumnavigate the blocks? So there's two answers to this question. Answer number one is we have a feature in Unblocker now. If what you're trying to do is a simple page load where you send us a page, and we need to pass some kind of browser fingerprinting test and then the website will show you the page and all you want to do is load the page and view the results 
we have support in Unblocker to use headless browsers under the hood to uh, load the page and evaluate JavaScript and snapshot the, the site result. If you need something like user behavior, clicking or, or something like this, then this is the use case where the data collection platform would be used. Uh, thank you, uh, Josh. And thank you for your um, questions and answers. And now I have a question uh, to the attendees. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, our session today. And uh, I would, since we are limited in time, I would like to know if, uh, would you like, uh, uh, would you like to uh, discuss uh, some of these um, topics with our Illuminati experts? And uh, I'm just going to launch the polling and you can see it on your screen. Uh, what would you like to discuss with the Illuminati expert? And you can have a multiple choice if you have more than one questions. If something is not answered during these uh, four sessions that we had today and you have uh, project in mind that you want to discuss in private or you hesitate to discuss during the public uh, session, please uh, go ahead and pick up uh, the, the answer. I can see that, uh, yeah, that uh, you're answering. 9% uh, uh, of the audience has voted. We'll wait uh, for another 10 seconds, uh, giving the chance everyone to answer. So uh, for you to understand during such session, you can address uh, any kind of uh, uh, problems you have, like architecture, what is the optimal way to build it, uh, optimization, what, how to how to build uh, the system which is going to be ergonomic towards your DevOps resources and uh, cost effective at the same time, or how to deal with particular uh, tough target sites that uh, you really want to uh, collect data from. So all this can be addressed. So thank you very much for everyone who uh, have voted. Uh, if you didn't want, but you still uh, uh, want to uh, have the uh, have the session with uh, our experts, you will get uh, this uh, link on your email. And uh, right now, I want to uh, introduce a little bit. Uh, like this is our team who is uh, who has been supporting you behind the scene today, and uh, they they are there with their schedule to answer your questions. And uh, the nice thing about this uh, workshop, uh, we appreciate your time that you spent today two hours with us. And we want to give you a bonus of $100 to experiment with our proxy and to test all the solutions that we have mentioned during the sessions. And uh, of course, we are going to share with you a presentation. You, you will be able to download it uh, as a PDF file and also recording of this uh, session. And uh, please stay in touch with us on uh, social media. Uh, we are presented on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and uh, uh, on uh, Reddit. So go ahead, uh, let's be friends. I know there are many people, we are friends already. And uh, thank you for your time. And it was a wonderful evening. Thank you very much for attending our data collection in retail workshop.